Dr. Jonathan Wells is a senior fellow at the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. He has two PhDs, one in molecular and cell biology from the University of California at Berkeley, and one in religious studies from Yale University. Subsequently, he has performed postdoctoral research at UC Berkeley and has authored two books concerning evolution. Specifically, and uh, probably most notoriously, in 2000, I published a book, Icons of Evolution, in which uh, I showed that uh, many of the major images used in biology textbooks as evidence for evolution, in fact, do not fit the evidence. Uh, I first discovered, the one I first discovered was the picture of embryos, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, because I was studying embryology, and I would compare the pictures with the embryos I was actually looking at and realized that there was a discordance there. And I went on from there to study various other icons and found similar discrepancies between the icon and the evidence. But for each icon that I deal with, what I do say, and I think legitimately, is that if this is thought or presented as some of the best evidence we have for Darwinian evolution, and so much of it is false, where does that leave the theory? Because sooner or later, if a theory is going to be scientific, you have to test it against the evidence. And if piece after piece of that evidence turns out to be uh, exaggerated or distorted or even faked, then I think the theory itself at some point becomes suspect. Your criticisms in icons of evolution tend to weaken evolutionary theory. Would you agree with that? The evidence is what weakens evolutionary theory. I have no desire to weaken any theory okay. except by comparing it with the evidence. What I don't want to weaken is science, but science thrives on comparing theory with evidence. I'm going to pick seven phyla, seven major groups. We're in the chordate group. If we look at the molecules in these organisms and we group them according to the similarity of their molecules, we can rearrange them thus. So these, the molecules here, are most similar. They're more similar to each other than they are to these, for example. These are more similar than they are to those. So we can regroup these according to the similarities in this particular molecule. Now, if we construct a tree, an evolutionary tree, following Darwin's pattern, based on this molecule, we get something like this. But be clear that the only data we have are up here. We have the molecules from these organisms, and the rest of this is inferred based on the assumption that they share a common ancestor. What's interesting is when we look at these molecules, various discrepancies immediately appear. For example, the tree I just showed you from 18S RNA doesn't fit the classical tree that had been drawn on the basis of morphology or anatomy. Animals that are close together up here are far apart over here. Not only that, if I pick a different molecule, 28 sRNA, I get a different tree again. Okay, here's the 18S tree, here's the 28S tree. Okay, once again, animals that are closely related by one are not closely related by another. Imagine if you found out that your grandfather was not the least bit related to you, but, you know, related to people half a world away. I mean, this is, this is pretty fundamental biology stuff, you know. It matters who you're related to. Even worse, if we take 18S RNA and submit it to two different laboratories, as it was done in this case, again, we get two different trees. So the molecular evidence is shot through and through with discrepancies. A recent article in Nature shows that this controversy is continuing. This, these trees here, it shows these two trees in nature. Here, we, the chordates, are most closely related to the arthropods or the insects. But according to this other molecular study, we're way off here and the insects are more closely related to roundworms. Now, these are not trivial issues in molecular or, uh, evolutionary biology. So, <clears throat> the inconsistencies in evolutionary trees based on mo molecular comparisons have to actually be explained away in the light of evolutionary theory. They actually don't provide evidence for the theory. Now, I'm not saying the theory is proven false, but this certainly doesn't provide evidence for it. <laughs>
Now, in Darwin's theory, this is a very simplified cartoon of it, the phyla that I showed you a few minutes ago are up here, and if we had a good fossil record, which of course we don't, we would expect to find something like this in the past, where these branch off somehow from a common ancestor that might be, for example, some form of worm. Ideally, this is what we would expect. When we go looking at the fossil record, what we find instead is this. Most of the major animal phyla appear abruptly, geologically speaking, in the Cambrian explosion. With no fossil evidence, they actually came from a common ancestor. Theory versus evidence. Now remember, common ancestry might be true at lower levels, but at this level, the, the level of the animal phyla, the fossil evidence certainly isn't helping us. Darwin himself recognized this. He said this actually uh, presented uh, a valid argument. Suddenly appear in the Cambrian must at present remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against his view of common ancestry. I would argue, as a biologist, that the problem has not been solved in the intervening 150 years, at least not from the fossil evidence. The way Darwinian evolution is often presented is though uh, there's overwhelming evidence for it and no dispute about it. Clearly that's not the case, so I do think students should be exposed at least in outline to these problems. Uh, what does it do to Darwin's theory? Well, I think it weakens Darwin's theory. The evidence weakens Darwin's theory. Uh, but for science, that's good. If the theory doesn't explain the evidence, then it should be weakened in the eyes of the students. They shouldn't be told something explains evidence that isn't there. They should be aware of the evidence. On the way down here, was finally getting a chance to read a book. It came out in 2003. It's called Origination of Organismal Form. Now, these are eminent evolutionary biologists. As far as I know, there is not an ID proponent in there, certainly not a creationist. Uh, as far as I know, all of them uh, have a faith that sooner or later, completely natural explanations will be found for all these phenomena. But to a person, these writers say quite clearly that there's a problem extrapolating microevolution to macroevolution, a scientific problem. It's just undeniable. It's throughout the scientific literature. With the hypothesis of uh, neo-Darwinian evolution that there is a common uh, ancestry, uh, why doesn't the analysis, the evidence that uh, about the 18S RNA tree versus the 28S RNA tree falsify that? Why doesn't that do that? In my opinion, because uh, neo-Darwinian evolution has left the realm of science. It, it now functions as an assumption, uh, an underlying given, a dogma. Uh, it cannot be falsified. Nothing will falsify it because it's just a given. Uh, it, it does make predictions. Uh, I would argue that virtually every prediction it has made above the species level has been falsified in the sense you just described. And yet the theory is still with us. And I would argue that that is evidence for its non-scientific nature. We have a lot of people addressing us and saying, well, this is not science. And why? And when I say, well, I think it has scientific basis, they still argue that it's not science. Can you address any of that? Why is intelligent design science then? Well, it's interesting. If you read the evolutionary literature, at least before the last few years when this started brewing uh, more heatedly, uh, Darwinian evolutionists have consistently argued against design. Darwin himself did. Hundreds of pages in The Origin of Species are devoted to arguing against design. The argument was the evidence will show that what looks like it's designed can actually be explained by natural processes. Now, if evidence can show that something is not designed, then in principle, evidence can show something is designed. You can't have it both ways. You can't say suddenly, well, you can't argue for design because all of a sudden that involves something supernatural. Darwin was excluding the supernatural and claiming that the evidence justified it. I would say if you're going to resort to evidence on one side, you can resort to it on the other. And for me, that's all intelligent design does. It says the evidence we see points to design. 